This afternoon's uh, presentation, actually with, with a presentation. Now I see the presenters have walked out the door. <laughs> Thanks, Sonny. Um, on behalf of the student body of the architecture department, the staff and the editors, we would like to contribute a copy of Glue, the student journal, to James Wine, as our, uh, our guest lecturer today. Thank you very much. And if you're not fortunate... And if you're not fortunate enough to be a guest lecturer and you'd like to have a copy for yourself, we will have a table set up after the lecture, $15 for students and $20 if not. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Neil Beckstead and Amanda Ike um, for the third time today, editors for the journal. Thank you, Luke. <clears throat> It's, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon. And a few moments ago, I asked him if I could make this uh, rather uh, informal. And I would like to start by uh, making reference to something that I found, uh, I think, positioned so I would find it. As I was uh, leaving this morning, uh, I noticed on the table in the breezeway between the house and the garage, uh, a paper which had, uh, which was actually a, a, a printout from the internet, and I'm almost certain that Carol Tiernan left it there for me to look at. Anyway, I read it, and the first paragraph in this is incredible because it relates, I think, in large measure to our speaker this afternoon. So I would like to, to start by just reading a piece of the first paragraph here. It says, designers are, to our information age, what engineers were to the age of steam and steel, what scientists and philosophers were to the age of reason. Designers set the mood of the mental environment, the look and lure of magazines, the tone and pull of TV, the give and take of the internet, the character and spirit of our habitat. <clears throat> I think in large measure, whoever wrote this was writing about our speaker today. Um, I'm going to just take a piece of the information from James Wine's um, website and, and share that with you. And for that, I have to have my glasses. <clears throat> James Wines is the founder, creative director, and president of SIGHT, and I think most, almost everyone here is familiar with the work of SIGHT. An architecture and environmental arts organization established in New York City in 1970. His work is internationally known for its uh, commitment to an integration of the arts and the fusion of buildings, landscapes, and public spaces with the surrounding environment. As a result of his contributions to environmental thinking, a number of Mr. Wine's earliest projects for site anticipated the 80s and 90s interest in narrative, deconstructivist, and green architecture. He is a sculptor, painter, graphic artist, teacher, uh, educational administrator working in the fields of architecture, landscape architecture, interior design, public art, television, uh, critical writing, and arts education. James Wines is an advocate of the concept of integrated systems in architecture based on ecological models found in nature. During the past decade, he has taken an, inter I'm sorry, he has taken an increasingly active role in the international green movement through projects, writings, lectures, and conferences. Since 1990, his major creative focus has been on the design of environmentally oriented cultural facilities, civic centers, and parks. He is also an advocate of interdisciplinary education and develops and teaches environmental design programs for colleges and universities. 
Some of you may also know Mr. Wines for his writing. Two books uh, I think all of us are familiar with, Architecture and Art and Architecture as Art and D Architecture. And we were hoping to have a book signing this afternoon of his new book. However, it will not be available until next week. <clears throat> and the title of that is The Art of Architecture in the Age of Ecology. One of the most interesting things that I find about James Wines is that he is able to do all of the things that he does that is design in all of the disciplines we represent and more. He's an educator. And the reason he's able to do this is because, in my words, he's a Renaissance man. In large measure, self-educated. Uh, some of you may not realize that Mr. Wine's formal education is as a sculptor. And yet he has been able to make inroads in all three disciplines that are represented in this college. Um, it's only because of his interest, uh, his intensity of uh, in looking at these three areas that he has been able to accomplish all that he has. It is a great privilege, I think, for the college to have James Wine join us this afternoon. Squirrel in the middle of my chair. 
And my wife said, oh, isn't that wonderful? You know, it's a sacrificial offering to you, James, you know. So, and, and so I, I couldn't get mad at the cat because I would disturb his little psyche if I, you know, if I, if I responded in any way, a negative way. So I had to pet the cat, you know, and remove the squirrel. But anyway, I'm, I'm learning to live with nature. It was the first time uh, I've ever owned a car. My wife drives the car, but it's the first time there's ever been a car in the family. So I guess I'll adjust, but uh, I, I decided maybe what I really am is an environmental theoretician who you know, is probably better adapted to, to urban life. But anyway, I, I would like to talk about a little bit about that today, but uh, I talked to Sonny before I got here, and when I, I decided to do I hope my voice lasts, by the way. I've been losing my voice for the last week. I hope it doesn't go in the next 10 minutes, <laughs> knock on wood. Um, I, what I thought I'd like to do is, um, uh, in, in a sense, give a kind of bio. I know that, you know, they're all young people in the room, and you're all, you're developing your ideas and your careers. And I thought it might be interesting and informative to sort of structure this, this lecture in a, in a sort of a biographical way, because I think the primary issue or problem, and I think often in, particularly in architecture, not so much in visual art, where I started my life, is um, this idea of clinging to, to old models, to things that are, are, are kind of rooted kind of forever, like for example, modernism and constructivism, which are now 95 years old, both of these movements, which are still dominant as, as stylistic forces in architecture. Whereas, you know, uh, you know, a sculptor today, and we're going to talk about a little later, would not be caught dead doing a, a cubist or constructive sculpture. It would be considered hopelessly old hat. But architecture, you know, is still blossoming under these, under these movements. But I think the thing that has to take place, I think particularly when you're young as a student, is the beginning of critical thinking. And if you're going to make an original statement, if you're going to have... Um, an interesting life in this profession. You want you want to you know make some progress or make some inroads or or change something. And uh, I sort of have always had that instinct. And uh, so what I thought I would do today is sort of kind of weave art, architecture, and a little biographical data. Um, I know that students hate these kind of what they call the dog and pony shows, where you just sort of show and tell. I mean, I know architects come and do that click, 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 and this is what I did 10 years ago, and this is what I did five years ago. So I'm hopefully I'll kind of be able to show you some things, um, and at the same time not fall into that rut of the dog and pony. Okay, I think we can, uh, oh, here, I guess we can uh, douse the lights here, and we'll plunge in. I, I'm grateful, by the way, that this, here, can I turn this on here? Let's ki uh, kill those lights too, probably, because probably, they're going to reflect off the screen here. Is that going? Uh -oh. oh, there you go. So I'm in sort of a glow here. Um, I'm grateful, by the way, that the technology is relatively simple. Now, one of my favorite stories on this whole high tech, uh, what they call state of the art theaters. A lot of universities are now getting state of the art. So what that really means is the poor speaker standing in front of something that looks like a 747 dashboard. And um, well, I was at one of them, and it was incredible. You know, you, get, you were terrified when it happened because they put you on the stage and said, as though, well, you'll be able to follow that. And you see about 100 buttons in front of you, and you, most of them make sense. In this particular case, you know, lights on, house lights up, house lights down, camera on, camera on, you know, all these things. But then there were two buttons way at the periphery. And I noticed that one was men's washroom and women's washroom. And this haunted me during this entire lecture because I couldn't imagine what you would want to do from the podium that would in any way affect these two facilities, you see. So all during this lecture, some of my fingers hovered above these buttons. And I was just dying to press one, but I was so terrified that, I don't know, it might be an ejection seat on the toilet or something, and you hear this shriek behind stage. But I, and I never found out why they did. I just didn't have the courage to ask. <coughs> anyway, uh, let me see if I can work this one. It seems simple enough here. Uh-oh, nothing happened. I push right. 
forward. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Sorry. I... See? Technology. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Bravo. All right. Um, well, I'm going to breeze very quickly. We're going to have some instant history here, but I think it's, it's, it's useful simply because it sort of establishes some, some guidelines. Um, clearly, if I'd been giving a talk like this, you know, a hundred years ago, I would be, you know, waxing enthusiastic about the new industrial age that's coming upon us and the salvation for humanity, the new socialism and so forth. Because obviously this century started with the worship of technology and the first of the industrial revolution. And, you know, every self-respecting architect in 1900 was in love with the machine. He was also in love with the idea of the factory, the new kind of Spartan vocabulary. I love this, by the way, this, this cover is just brilliant. This, is, this goes, this is the essence of Spartanism. And so every architect really loved that. And, you know, you would design a school like the Bauhaus uh, based on the factory. No, no, no ivy covered walls here, the whole mission was to strip away the past, get rid of all that old Beaux-Arts stuff, and reveal the new sensibility for the new age. Now, around in 1910, when Chernikov did work like that, these were truly revolutionary. They were also rooted in the culture, rooted in the spirit of revolution. Um, yeah, I mean, even Corbusier, I mean, he, he, barely, he, he rarely photographed one of his buildings where there wasn't a Citroen in the front yard or a dirigible flying overhead lest you miss the references. So there would always be this connection between, you know, the building as a combustion engine with a combustion engine sitting very nearby. Um, now, at that time, there was a whole different mandate, a whole different uh, goal involved. I mean, uh, Corbusier talked about the Villa Savoie the machine for living in, and it was really based on cubism and the idea of leaving behind all of the residuals of the 19th century, the, the kind of urbanism, the kind of form, the kind of decor of that time, and adapting architecture, particularly the Cubism. Cubism was certainly a very dominant influence because it naturally fed in with the formal elements into architecture. So uh, when Corbusi was thinking about a building, it was really like a combustion engine. It was this kind of energetic, a uh, formal statement. Uh, it became, in a sense, a kind of essence. It's now become almost a paradigm for working, a, a way of working with form. Um, <coughs> but the one thing that has occurred to me, certainly in the last um, decade or so, is that we, in a sense, have our new Beaux-Arts. We have, between the influences of modernism and constructivism, such a, a kind of implicit language of architecture, the idea of, of, of the way of making it that has almost become as act academic, if not more so in a way. And I think the Beaux-Arts only lasted about 35 years, whereas these two movements have dominated. So you would have these kinds of gestures, and just think of the number of architects who have, who have, have built entire careers off of this one house. Certainly Richard Meyer has. I mean, these are, this is a in a sense, after the uh, invention. But it, it has become style more than substance. I think this is Architectonica, uh, Mario Botta. I mean, there's so much of the language now that we recognize. I mean, I think it's time, I guess what I'm basically saying, it's probably time, particularly for your generation, I don't know if my generation can do anything at this point, but certainly for the younger generation, to start rethinking the whole thing. Uh, another invention of Corbusier uh, back in the 30s was this sort of Esprit Nouveau building. I mean, here you, here you certainly see the, the beginnings of, um, of uh, and, and also with Chernikov and Constructionism, you certainly see the beginnings of the, of the Pompidou Center. You see the roots of the Pompidou Center being born. But somehow, you know, when it's done, his, you know, when, when Corbusier did it back then, it was being done for the first time. And so it has a kind of different energy. I mean, this, this is far more flamboyant. It's far more excessive than the, the, that little pavilion by Corbusier. But I'm not sure it's better. Matter of fact, they just, as you know, had to repair this building. And it cost more to renovate it 
and, and repair it than they did to build it in the first place. So there's a kind of an environmental concern. Because another big influence is Schroeder Schrader House, the idea of partitioning space, heavy influence on the early Peter Eisenman, uh, this idea of breaking space into series of planes, which is almost implicit. I've, I've noticed when like, students work, almost the first thing you, they do before they even understand the program is all of a sudden the little planes all starting to appear, whether that program calls for that or not. So there are a lot of this language. Then, we, of course, we went into the period of postmodernism, which was supposedly a reaction against all this. Um, and what it was is kind of um, taking modernism and absorbing um, certain influences and certain vocabularies from the past. So you have Michael Gray's um, uh, public services building in Portland, which is chock full of, of banners and ribbons and references to Greco-Roman culture and so forth, as, you know, the Piazza d'Italia by Charles Moore, which is almost an exactly number of historical references. Presumably this was ironic, but I'm not sure how ironically it's come around full circle. Then, uh, obviously about 10 years ago, um, so-called neoconstructivism, or what they call deconstructivism, uh, started. Um, apparently that's kind of a misrepresentation, really, because I know the head of the uh, philosophy department at the New School, and he said that uh, anybody who compares, uh, you know, the analysis of language through deconstruction to to the kind of formalism of architecture as an idiot. I mean, he really is very, very hostile to that whole idea. But anyway, it has been done, whether we like it or not. It's been called deconstructivism, related to, you know, Derrida and so forth. But it really relates very much back to the work of Chernikov, Melnikov, and the Russian constructivists. I mean, you would hardly think of this building being done in, I think, about 1912. Uh, but, and, and here's, you know, Coop Himmelblau out today. You can see the, certainly that the language was formed very, very solidly then, and then it's been exploited and changed. And this is a series of pavilions by Chernikov, again in the 30s, and here's Bernard Schumi in the, about ten, eight or ten years ago in uh, Park. Here's another Chernikov city plan from the 20s, and uh, here's Rem Cool House a few years ago. So you can certainly see that there's a language, and again, here's Melnikov. I mean, this idea of taking a building and then adding this kind of a, a truncated pieces to the building. And that's an idea that's certainly been picked up by Frank Gehry. So there are these languages that have been around an awful long time. And I think probably for the young people in this audience, this is the, you're at the threshold of change. Um, now let's just switch. I'm going to switch back and forth between art and architecture because I, I bridge them both in my life. Now, for example, um, from the beginning of modernism and cubism, part of the idea was to reject all of that referential realism. But the one thing they didn't reject, which was interesting to me, is they didn't reject the base. I mean, here you have a, you know, a kind of cubist-influenced sculpture by uh, Lipschitz, but you see the basic language uh, has remained the same. And you, you see there's these, this idea of the contained object. It's really a kind of object thinking. And um, another thing, of course, that was rejected, uh, as I mentioned before, was the Beaux-Arts, the idea of borrowing the, uh, the language from history, which after a while becomes tired because it's been borrowed too often and too long. The replacement of that, again, with Corbusier, was the idea of this, this, this grandiose city where he, he was always talking about letting the sun in, but by spreading the buildings so far apart, the buildings just suddenly become very, very, you know, highly ego-charged, you know, sort of phallic objects, which has sort of dominated architecture ever since. Uh, where would Donald Trump be without this language? And um, then the, the ground plan, the place for the people, with these huge spread out spaces, where, of course, now we recognize that people have no identity in those spaces. So there was a lot of problems, in the, in, even in the original vision, some of the early dreams. Um, I don't know how many students are familiar with this incredible movie, The Fountainhead, but you all should rent it if you can find it in a historic uh, video store. But it's great because it's, uh, it's you know it's about the about the art, the modern architect, and here he is played by Gary Cooper, stripping the offensive history off the building to reveal the pristine reality of tomorrow. You know. 
And uh, it's really interesting. Uh, if you would change the story today, it would be the complete opposite. My wife has this idea of writing this uh, kind of satirical novel, um, kind of the, the feminist version of the Fountainhead called The Maidenhead. And she's going to have this, you know, this obviously a woman architect who's much more humanistic and earth-centric and so forth. But the idea of the big ego, this big object, notice this object thinking. In this case, you know, I remember, uh, I don't know if you saw the movie, but throughout the entire movie, Gary Cooper and these big towers he's designing, it's a, it's a very phallic movie, and, and he's always standing with his legs spread apart, and there's always some woman clutching at his pant legs, you know, hungry with desire. And then he's got behind him, there's always this huge tower. So they think it was fraught with symbolism and uh, rich with symbolism, but it still continues. Here's, here's uh, <laughs> Philip Johnson ready, ready to plunk down his building. And it's, it's very much like object art, object everything. I mean, here, here you have, you, know, you go to a museum and there's the base and you admiringly look at the object. You're looking at it apart from any of the other references of anything around it. And the Philip Johnson building, I mean, I'm sorry, um, this building could be treated actually in the same way. You see, you can see this kind of worshipful looking at the building sitting on the base. Now, uh, and then uh, when you see something like the Frank Lloyd Wright house, which is in model form at the Museum of Modern Art, it's absolutely absurd. It doesn't work as a model because what it does is it takes a fragment of the environment and portrays the house as, you know, part of a little fragment. But what you don't get is that when you go to that area where falling water is, the entire context for miles around anticipates the house. So the sensibility of right in that particular case was to absorb and to the entire context. The building's about the context and not about necessarily being an object. So it doesn't look right as a model. It doesn't look correct as a model. Now another issue that comes out, and this is something, again, I'm just throwing this out to think about. This is not really considered necessarily a critique, but it, it does come up and it, and it has bothered me because I, I wrote an article some, uh, about a year ago called the pedestal test <coughs> excuse me and the um, point of the article was to look at all of the pedestal architecture that's been produced and see relative, rel relative to sculpture how it stacks up now if you look at a piece of sculpture like that uh, I used to say no self-respecting sculpture would produce anything today that looks like this I mean this is obviously very old-fashioned sort of neo-cubist language. If you, again, if you look at it up close, you see that these forms, if put on a pedestal, would be dismissed instantly. In the New York art world, they'd laugh you out of the room. But what's interesting is the, what is considered the most important building uh, produced in the last 10 years, the Frank Gehry building in Bilbao, is exactly the same language. So you have to start out, certainly as a young person, I would question if this indeed is very old-fashioned and related to another time, does making it huge on a giant scale as architecture make it more relevant? These are questions, I think, that we have to start opening up for ourselves. But anyway, what I'm talking about is a kind of pedestal test. I think that when you're working, you have to sort of bridge that gap, because what is considered sophisticated or relevant in one profession may in fact, if crossing the fence to the other side, may not have that same energy or may not be perceived as having that same energy. So it's worth thinking, I don't any artifact, this is my kind of a statement from my book, uh, which can be visually improved by its presentation on a pedestal, is simply reinforcing its limited state of objectness. And that's kind of what I'm talking about today, this idea of object thinking which is really quite different than what I would call environmental thinking. Where in other words, environmental thinking, when you're absorbing large amount of information from lots of sources and letting it filter through, or whether you're creating a building as a collection of forms. Um, uh, one of the arguments I'm getting against, um, at Penn State against collaboration, is that architects after all feel they're form makers, and they don't need any help in making the form. Well, that seems to me to limit unbelievably 
the, the value and message of what architecture is all about. Where's the content? If we're only form makers, then where, in fact, is the content? Uh, another issue is, of course, this idea of separating everything, the kind of the vision of the city where everything is objects separated, one apart from the other, and with these vast expanses in between. And that has become an archetype, and it was and an unsuccessful one in many cases. I mean, if you, could, if you would plant it from, uh, you know, Corbusier's Voisin plan for Paris into someplace like Detroit, you realize that it totally destroyed the economy of the downtown. I mean, nobody in their, in their right mind goes there after 5 o'clock. And as you know, certainly Detroit is having real economic problems as a result of this paradigm. Another thing that's very peculiar to me is everybody pays, well, in fact, uh, I think Italy collects something like $78 billion a year in tourist money for people who go to look at places like this. So if we really love them that much, then why do we reject them as part of our daily life? Now, these are questions that, you know, why is this our paradigm for building? Why is this the industrial age? Is this the only paradigm? Is this the only way we can look at the city? And I think, that, again, these are the kind of the big questions that are coming out. Um, when I was a sculptor, I was also very aware that object thinking, you know, dominated um, the sculpture, especially public art. Um, I think I coined the two phrases. I wrote an essay about 20 years ago, and I think I coined two phrases. One was plop art, and the other was the turd in the plaza. And, uh, <coughs> and basically, that's what happens. In other words, you have a corporate captain up on the top of this building, and he looks down and he says, my God, you know, it looks empty down there, he says to his architect. And so the architect does a sculptor up in Connecticut who has something that's too big for the barn. So they move it down here. And it never works. I mean, whether it's good sculpture or bad sculpture, is irrelevant. It, it's, it's irrelevant altogether. In fact, in this case, it even frightens small children. <laughs> so um, what I've really, uh, again, having lived in Italy for a decade of my life, uh, the one thing that does come out there very, very strongly is the fact that one of the primary functions of architecture, in, in the true functional extent, was to communicate. The communication, these were the, this was the internet of its time, definitely. I mean, the walls of buildings were encrusted with information. You had a consensus community, really, that believed in the information that, they, that, that this information could communicate to. So, these are things that we really lack. Again, I'm, I'm kind of throwing out a lot of problems today for you to solve. I, mean, I haven't solved them myself, but not the least of which is this fusion of architecture and, arch and sculpture. We're talking about fusion today. Here's the Trevi Fountain, this masterful concept of taking the Poli Palace and then metamorphosizing it into sculpture, kind of into landscape in this case, which serves as an incredible magnet for people because of the scale references, because of the biomorphic connections. I mean, you can see what happens here as opposed to what happens in this new public space in California. Uh, so you really, the idea of formalism, I mean, the idea of just shape making, form making, space making for its own sake, really doesn't always work. In fact, it seldom works, and that's one of the issues too. Another aspect of this uh, object art thinking is, this, is, again, the separation. I mean, you know, again, a decade ago or so, um, if you had absolutely no imagination whatsoever, the corporation would put a Henry Moore in front of the building. That was kind of the, again, the archetype of public art. So you put the Henry Moore down. Now, you know, again, historically buildings were knit together. You know, the iconography, the readability of the building, the imagery sculpture was knit together. So what has happened really, you know, basically in the last 20 or 30 years, or the last couple of hundred years really actually, we've gone from this mentality to, to this mentality. And this is the, really the compounding, not only in architecture of object thinking, but in everything of object thinking. So everything is now separate, everything is specialized, nothing goes together. All right, this is where the biographical part starts a little bit. Um, you have to promise not to laugh. If anybody laughs, I'll run off the stage in humiliation. But here I am, the boy sculptor. When I first got out of school, I was, in fact, a constructivist sculptor. You know, I mean, I wrenched pieces of iron into kind of great curvilinear shapes. And um, at that time, even at that time, when I finally, after a few years of doing this, sort of, and I was, 
you know, quite successful, I think, as a sculptor. And I rejected it, again, at that time, and this is, again, you know, shortly after I got out of college, really, I was rejecting what I considered old-fashioned or what I considered irrelevant, a, a, a vocabulary that no longer had any meaning. But anyway, at that time, look at all that black hair, for example. Uh, I was filling up my studio. I had a studio in Rome and a studio in New York, and I filled them up with these kind of big things. They were usually concrete and steel and mixed together, I mean, woven together. So I filled up rooms with these things. Um, and at the same time, I wanted to also sort of plunk in here a little bit of, of, of kind of what I would call uh, epical references. Because my life has been basically dominant. I think we're all dominated to some extent the world we live in. You know, I, you know, I went through the Nixon era. I mean, remember that period where they told, you know, he lied about everything and he said, well, they're on the moon and I never believed him. And uh, then we went on to that kind of fuzzy period with Reagan and Reaganomics, you know, where they were kind of dependent on this look to the stars for the answers. And then we went to the more assertive period of George Bush. <laughs> and uh, then from that, we went into the me decade. I mean, this is all my life. I mean, this isn't necessarily your life. But these are the influences of my life. And then Trump, you remember, with everything in the 80s is about money. And then finally, the fall of Trump, you know, he lost all his money, and people began to turn, return to real values. And uh, then they started talking about the decaying of America at the end of the 80s. And then we went into the 90s. You know, businessmen were very confused. And then finally, we ended up in the age of anxiety and certainly the dominance of chaos theory where we sort of find ourselves today. So these are issues that were really much, very much a part of my growing up. So when I was back then, you know, I guess in the 60s, doing constructivist art, you know, can I look at those pieces? It's very funny because I certainly see in them, inherently in them, a lot of the language that's now still being worked out in architecture. So I said, how can, how can architecture still be involved with this kind of twisting, wrenching, chopping, you know, rotating of space, when in fact, I thought it was dead back then. So how can it possibly be alive? And then I also started working for architects. I started doing, well, I did big kind of minimal pieces, which they all like, because you know, I thought circular pieces went well for, with um, square buildings. And uh, I did a lot of big pieces. But you can see, in the, I mean, it was very, very architectonic. I would say that there are buildings now that have this language in them. I mean, you could, you could pluck this sculpture out, turn it upside down, and make a building out of it. There's no question. But anyway, the thing I hated most about my life at that point was I'd make these things in Italy, and we'd pack them up in a box, they'd ship them off in a box, then they'd pull them out of the box, and then they'd kind of lower them over the plaza, and then, you know, plop into the plaza they went. This entire process offended me after a while. I just couldn't see it as being interesting. At the other hand, at the same time that I was kind of still doing this sort of thing, the art world was changing. I mean, uh, a person like Duchamp had become kind of revisited after being sort of obscure for a number of years under the years of abstract expressionism and all this kind of bombastic work that was being done in, by American painters. All of a sudden, a, a, a generation in the uh, late 50s, in the 60s, began to look at Duchamp and realize this guy worked with ideas. He was in the realm of ideas. In other words, he didn't make objects. He made situations. Like when he put a urinal into an art gallery for the first time, it was an act of displacement. In other words, it didn't change the urinal. What the urinal did was change everything else in the space. I mean, it meant that, for example, Henry Moore could go on making those, those big, you know, amoebic shapes if he wanted to. But it did command him at that point to make something at least as interesting as a urinal. So this idea of ideas was really, really important. It's very different than Picasso and Cubism and assemblage and collage and so forth. So he, you know, Duchamp was not a collagist. He was really a thinker. I mean, he was taking situations and taking non-identifiable things with no, you know, particular emotional quality and charging them with energy by, by the juxtaposition of situation. So they weren't so much objects as they were changers of context. Uh, other artists that began to pick up on it, Rauschenberg, remember the famous bed that he did? He took his own bed and, and, and just turned it up against the wall and transformed it into a painting. So you again had this kind of bridge between art and life. 
uh, Jasper Johns painting a flag where it's not a, a illusory flag anymore. It's not waving in the wind. It's not old glory. It's an object. But the fact that he paints it in a consummate way, it is both painting and object, illusion and non-illusion. So artists really began dealing with ideas. And this is when art really started interesting. Then there was also the earth art movement, uh, which was very much influenced by, by, by inscribing on the land, looking anew at the landscape. Uh, and I was a, a participant, actually an early participant in this. I did some sculptures that were sort of for, for landscape situations. And uh, yeah, I, at that time, I was friends with people like Robert Smithson and Carl Andre and quite a few of the artists at that time. This is a brilliant work by Smithson. I mean, this is, you know, should have influenced landscape architecture a lot because Smithson was not only a good conceptual artist, but he was a, a, a great thinker about landscape. Uh, Mike Heiser, again, working in the environment. So you began to get go into a flow of period where idea, gesture, statement, attitude were beginning to mean a lot more in art. Uh, here's uh, a work by Grosner, which, you know, again, is, is a building in itself. The piece articulates from inside to outside the architecture of the situation. Well, obviously, this kind of work is radically different in every way, much more profound, much more interesting, much more adventuresome than the classical plop art that we discussed before. Um, now, this is kind of where I guess my, my own work sort of began to take shape. Because by that time, I had rejected all the constructivist work that I was doing. I kind of you know, went out with the ash can. I think, by the way, just as a comment to young people, I know it's a very difficult thing. You know, you go to school, you learn some technique, or you, you pick up something from the, the last issue of Architectural Record, you finally perfect it, and then all of a sudden somebody tells you, well, you know, that's pretty, pretty, you know, obsolete, you know, nobody does that anymore. And uh, you feel sort of defeated. You feel like, oh my God, I've I, I just perfected it, and now they tell me it's not, not any good anymore. Well, more than anything else, I think that the only way to arrive at real art or real content is through your own devices, through your own thinking, uh, from, from something that you have inside of you that has to get out. I mean, that sounds like a cliche, but it's absolutely true. Um, it, it's, as long as you're picking it up for the latest issue of Architecture Magazine or something, already it's been, been filtrated. It's already been dissipated by, by, by the work of others, really. And it's very, very difficult. You can take a context of an idea. For example, um, there are a few architects now who are kind of, in a sense, treating constructivism in a rather ironic way, as though you don't take it seriously. It's just kind of a device for, that's suited to irony. But that's not the same as kind of seriously making form. Well, at that time, I was really through with object art. I didn't want to make object art anymore. A client gave me a parking lot to deal with. And what I did is I parked all the cars under the paving. You know, that was really taking, it was a kind of inversion of, of uh, the industrial age because here was petroleum consuming the car instead of the car consuming petroleum. Now, I learned a lot from this project. This isn't a very simple project, but I learned a lot from it. One thing I learned, um, I remember when we were uh, gathering the cars to bury them, uh, there was a high school next door, and, a bunch of the students, kind of tough kids, came over and said, well, we're going to trash all those cars tonight. So we had to get guards out, and, you know, they, for a few days, they guarded the cars so the kids didn't trash them. But then about the third or fourth day, the kids came back, and we were burying the cars. Now, any self-respecting vandal knows when they've been outdone. And uh, I can't tell you the amount of respect I got from that point on. I mean, they were running for coffee, they were running for my lunch, they would do anything just because I finally out-vandalized them in a way. And uh, you, you already got the cooperation of the community in this kind of situation. And what I really began to realize is that there is a public sensibility, there is a contextual sensibility that has nothing to do with object making. In other words, if you took this, this uh, project, if this, you took this project and put it in a museum, it would have no meaning whatsoever. It has to be in an American strip parking lot. It has to be in the world of banality to have any meaning. And that's, that was a very important turning point. I mean, that's kind of where you 
clean off your desk and start over. You say, well, I, I did something, it was kind of a breakthrough for me, it went on to the next phase. After that, I, the first few projects I did had to do with cars. We did a, a big public space for an expo in Canada, which was the history of transportation technology. So we took this idea of you know, air, land, and sea, and we made this huge artery which connected the Vancouver Harbor to the city, went up under the viaducts and broke off. And what it was is the entire history of 20th century transportation, really a description, of, it's like a pavilion of history, all monochromed and all mounted on this great artery. So it became this massive public sculpture, almost a half a kilometer long. And what we did is we just took historic objects, we cleaned them inside and outside, uh, got rid of all the grease and oil, and coated them, you know, monochromed them, and then, you know, then mounted them on the paving. So then they went off into outer space. At the other end, uh, the airplane went underwater at high tide, of course, and the seals from the harbor would come up and sit on the car. So there was a lot of interaction, a lot of public interaction. For example, again, look at the, the vast sensibility difference between object making and what's going on, or even displays. I mean, this, you know, this is not a display either. This is like this one, uh, for example, is kind of public art, and this one is, you know, like display of artifacts. And this is kind of neither, you see. Um, again, what was good about this, I think, is that what I learned from this was that by monochroming and setting back, you animated people. So people and the performance, the prosthetic aspect, became more important than the sculpture. Because it really activated humans, human beings, which architecture doesn't do very often. Um, a look at the magazines. Most of the buildings are photographed. They clean the people off. God forbid a human body should offend the sculpture, you see. So it's kind of the opposite mentality. Whereas I really like this idea of what I would call prosthetic thinking, which means you're really involving the body in a very active way. And then again, creating you know, public symbols. Well, anyway, by this time, I had kind of lost all interest. Again, this is, I'm only speaking for myself, but, but I would say that the reason I'm doing this is obviously to kind of show you the kind of cleansing of your mind that you have to do every once in a while to, to kind of get on with the next thing you're going to do. I, I was really no longer interested in architecture as partitioning of space. So the, I, I mean, not that it can't be space, but it had to be space of a new kind or a new, a new definition. I mean, the idea of, of breaking it up in this manner did not interest me at that point. Um, <clears throat> case in point, I was a judge on a jury about uh, 12, 13 years ago. And the jury loved this thing, I mean, the rest of the jury, and I hated it. And uh, I didn't vote for it, but it did win a prize. And I, I photographed it, and I said, you know, I'm going to show this to every architecture student in the world because they should all see it. And what's unique about this, this is a work of architecture by, a, I think, a graduate student in London that has every single dull cliche of the 20th century embodied in a single work. <laughs> and um, so what you could do is you could paste this up over your drawing board. And if there's anything in your computer or on your drawing board that looks like anything in this picture, you're probably in big trouble. <coughs> But anyway, what it did bring out to me is that the question of conceptual sensibility in architecture, I mean, changing your attitude. In fact, Duchamp had a great saying that I think should be blazoned across the doorway of every architecture school. He, he said, I taught myself to contradict myself in order to avoid conforming to my own taste. And uh, if you can manage to do that, you'll get ahead in the world. But anyway, uh, let's take something like a teacup. Give a teacup problem to a designer or an architect, and they would design it. They redesign the teacup. I, not that it needs redesigning, but they would. Give the same problem to an artist, for example, Merritt Oppenheim, who did this fur line teacup. And it's an act of transformation. It's psychological, it's erotic, it's um, mysterious. It, it's, it's another kind of conceptual thinking. But it's not a kind of conceptual thinking that architecture can do without. I think it's a very important level. Now, uh, just as a kind of facetious comment, um, I, I've always said that if we didn't know who Merit Hoppenheim was, if she wasn't a famous artist, and uh, you packaged this up and sent it to, I mean, 10 formalist architects, what they would probably do is shave it and then redesign it. And uh, 
really, I think that we are burdened in architecture with a, what I would call a design, uh, a design sensibility, really. A thing that where everything is manifested in a kind of compromise. Like art is something you compromise for function, or art is something you compromise to arrive at some sort of formal result. So I think that that's changing. Uh, and it began to change actually in the 70s. Um, I was very good friends with a number of kind of artist architects, one of which was Gordon Matta Clark, who was an absolutely brilliant trained architect at, at uh, Cornell, but then became an artist. But what he would do is he would take archetypal buildings, talk about real deconstruction, I and mean, he would take uh, I think Derrida indicated that you can't have deconstruction unless you have an archetype that you invade with words to change the meaning. I mean, you're basically looking at altered meanings by invasion, by inversion, and so forth. Matt Clark would take, for example, a typical house like this, even one destined to be torn down, and in this case, he split the house down the middle like this and opened it up, so you'll have a kind of inside-outside relationship. Now, in a funny way, the house was being preserved because now it was art. Um, but look at this attitude. I mean, this is, again, a conceptual, um, really complex attitude towards uses of space and the nature of architecture. Architecture is a subject matter, for example. Uh, the difference between this, for example, and a split in a Mario Botta building. Now here you have a split, but it's a very much a design, sort of if you please kind of split, you know. You kind of bow and curtsy. It's a kind of curtsy situation, whereas Matt Clark was obviously about very different, different ideas altogether. Um, Robert Smithson, The Buried Shed, which is really a memorial to the students killed at Penn, uh, Kent State. Again, using architecture as a kind of social message. Um, this is an Italian artist who was working in the Midwest, Johnny Pettina, who took a house, um, the standard uh, suburban house, and completely caked it with mud while the family was on vacation. And, you know, completely transformed the house, this kind of inversion of architecture. Naturally, the neighbors were a little disturbed when they got home. <coughs> but nevertheless, it was, a, it was a masterful transformation. He did it also in Minneapolis with the administration building there. He, he and the students during the Christmas holidays sprayed water over the building and froze the administration building. Again, the kind of urban version. And they did it to a little private house too. They built a frame around the house and froze it into a block of ice. So, um, and now, I'm just showing you several examples. Another is uh, uh, Hans Hockey for the Biennale a few years ago, took the um, first Biennale that was opened by Hitler and uh, he did a memorial to that where he took the entire floor of the German pavilion and broke it up so you would be walking on this crunching, cracking floor, which again is using architectural situation for, for cultural commentary. Um, this is a, a piece by um, um, Vito Acconci for the uh, Mach Vienna Museum where he took the museum, the conventions of the museum, and then completely distorted the interior. So you'd walk in, and it was the same museum, but it was a completely distorted space. The reason I'm showing you is just trying to give you an idea of the possibilities. It, um, these are, again, we all work together, all of these artists and um, site and everything. We were very good friends. We all had ideas in common. We frequently had meetings. We don't see as much of each other anymore. In fact, Matt Clark, of course, is dead. But uh, Vito Conchi and I still see each other occasionally. But anyway, it was the beginning of this idea. And that time, I wrote a book called the architecture, which started this kind of thing. It was actually the first book with this. Okay, now can I turn on the other one? I have to turn on the other other machine here. Just change the reel to the, oh there it is there it is. Well, just change the reel to that one then. Oh, 
Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, again, uh, just to return briefly to uh, Duchamp, and uh, again, an artist I've respected tremendously, particularly his works that dealt with architecture. This is the uh, famous glass, large glass. Uh, and this is the way it should have been seen. It's, it's in the Philadelphia Museum, but it's obviously isolated. But it was originally done for a window in the Catherine Dreyer house. So in a, in a sense, it was this brilliant idea of a painting that you see right through. So you had to reconcile, in a sense, the interaction of the, of the solid objects on the glass against what was going on in the garden. So you had a painting that was bridging illusion and reality. And uh, it was, a, you know, again, a brilliant example of the kinds of things that I think architecture should do. Another was his Rue Le Rie door, a very simple project, but so brilliant. It was a door in his apartment, and when it was open in the kitchen, it was closed on the bathroom. And when it was closed on the bathroom, it was open on the kitchen. So conceptually, it was not a typical door that was either open or closed. It was always simultaneously open and closed. So it's, again, this kind of thinking that I think that really would enrich uh, the field of architecture. And it was certainly, a, again, another big influence on my life was the, the plays of Samuel Beckett. Uh, I love the way he would work with conventions of the proscenium, like having actors that can't move. He would bury his actors on stage. So you'd have an entire play which was supposed to be kinetic normally, and it would not be. Yet another play which was all done by megaphones and no movement. So I think that these are the ideas that inform and make, you know, or have made a much richer climate of thinking than probably some of the formalistic um, inventions of architecture, at least in the past decade. I would say certainly not at the beginning of the century. Anyway, when I got my career going, I, the first thing I got was shopping centers to do, and you know, no self-respecting architect would do this kind of work. But I was interested because it was actually where the people are. I mean, if you, if you really think about it, the, the kind of junk world is where you find the people, so why not do it? And I worked for a company called Best, and they did these big supermarket box, boxes, and it was owned by an art collector, so he's pretty sophisticated, but basically the buildings were ugly beyond belief. The only thing that occurred to me is that, and this was, again, a conceptual breakthrough for me anyway, is that they came invested with a lot of reflex identification. I mean, you knew exactly what this building did. It was very much like a ready-made by Duchamp. You just knew it. You knew what it was. You knew what it did. You didn't have to design it. There was no need to design it. You destroy it if you designed it. And uh, so I got into this idea of what if architecture was not a design problem, but was a subject matter of art, and that, or, or, the, or the victim of sculpture in a way, or the victim of art. Now, at that time, when I first got this client, he was a big collector of, of mainly pop art and conceptual art. And um, he didn't know much about architecture, and, and he was always saying, well, I want sculpture around my buildings because, you know, I'm an art collector and I want to, you know, demonstrate to the public that I'm, not, I'm a cultured person. And at that time, you know, they were plunking down Henry Moore sculptures at Lincoln Center. So, you know, I, what I, this is actually part of my first presentation. I wanted to dissuade him from this direction. So I said, well, this is, you know, Lincoln Center, and here's one of your buildings. And I said, you, you certainly wouldn't want to do that, would you? And he said, oh, my God, he's a very pragmatic guy. He said, oh, no, no, that would take up parking spaces, you know. <laughs> so um, then I showed him, you know, kind of the POMO approach. He said, oh, I wouldn't want to do that. That would make me look too expensive. So at that time, um, there was a big article in the uh, architectural record. And the title of the article was The Cutting Edge of shopping center design. And I think this was by Caesar Pelli. At that time, the, the way the article was written, the cutting edge meant that he had improved the graphics, that he gave the building a nice color, there was an aluminum trim, there was a new logo. You know, in a sense, a, a litany of formalist gestures that improved the building. So when Site came out with its first building, it obviously made a lot of architects angry. I remember at that time when we first opened this building and it was published, um, there was the next issue of the magazines, whatever, wherever it was published, it would always start with cancel my subscription. 
and they would describe it as you know this the end of architecture and you know and and destroying all values and everything but i can almost almost say without reservation that american architecture architects in general didn't have a clue to what this whole thing was about because american architecture has been completely behoven to european modernism i mean that's the only language they could think of and so, it, you know, it was, I don't want to call it a joke, it was called, you know, falling down building, it was about, you know, all the things it wasn't about. Um, it was, in fact, using the inversion of architecture or sculptural gestures, in this case, you guess you know, as a commentary, obviously, an inverse commentary, but a commentary on architecture. Uh, I remember there were articles up here in the newspaper. Every time an article would appear like uh, about something like this, right at the bottom of the page, our building would be reproduced as though there was some analogy between destruction and evil and urban decay and so forth. But the one thing it was about was context. It was you know, it was about the, the kind of perverse connections between you know the houses around there, and you could see the building kind of rising all around and. And then this is like the junk strip. I mean, you'd certainly be sure that any grandmother and grandfather driving by this building would probably go off to the next turnoff to find out what was going on, at least. So that had a public meaning. It had a, a, a clear-cut public meaning. And it was really about building as process. In other words, all the things that architects don't look at, you know, they, just the process became part of the statement of the building. It was really about that. What's interesting to me, though, like, when this was first built, as I said, every architect in the world hated it. Then after a while, everybody got sort of used to it. And they said, well, you know, I kind of like those, you know, ragged edges. That, so they immediately, it became formalized. And uh, an art, architect like uh, Izosaki, for example, did what I would call the if you please version. Here you can see the bricks are sort of very textured and they have a, kind of, they have a nice context and everything is very sweet. But clearly this, architectural understanding of what site was doing at that time I mean, this is radically different this is about something completely different and I think understanding is, a, is, is a very important I, what we were really talking about is going beyond elements which actually exist in favor of thoughts about things which are implied to exist so it was a kind of contextualism that had to do with attitude towards situation and from that point on, we did a whole series of buildings, which you probably know. We did the Tilt Building in uh, Baltimore. Again, they were very simple statements, and I think that the, that's the point, is uh, they were very much a, a kind of spatial thing. That we could also work on a scale. I know Richard Serra, for example, the sculptor, wants to work on this giant scale. But the one thing about architecture, it allows you to do these kinds of things. It allows you to create titanic you know, planes and spaces of a different kind. Um, but the, and the, you know, it also was, you know, it also had a social side. It had another implication to it, which I think was very important. Now, after we did this building, there, there was a rash of buildings done in that manner as well. I mean, for example, Fuxas did one in Italy. But now, the difference is this is too fussy. This is too many ideas in one. I mean, it's too many ideas that are irrelevant to this idea of inversion or this idea of social connect connections. Here it's becoming decorative, uh, and also in the, in the case of Frank Gehry, here it's becoming very formalized, the idea of tilting and, 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 and warping space. Um, whereas this was really about something completely different. In fact, um, I always enjoy things like, you know, some lady sh on, on opening day sh shows up and she looks at this, she says, my God, she says, how am I gonna get up to that doorway? So, you know, it, it had a sense of other, other meanings, other readings, other situations. And we went on to do a whole series. I said, this one, I was always interested in having the building move while the people stood still. So, in fact, you know, you pushed a button in the morning and the building would crack open, you know, it slide open gradually and then it let all the people in. So, again, the prosthetic aspect was the, was the sudden movement and the quiet and, the, and you would play with people's actions and interaction with architecture. Um, this actually has become very popular recently. This is a very early project of site of rolling the parking lot over the building. But I notice now that almost every building you see has got kind of an undulating roof. This has become the big thing. But this was really done back in the early 70s. It was, again, the idea of just, you know, warping space and uh, developing this kind of roll over, over the building. Uh, 
taking a park down. This was an inside-outside thing. Actually, the owners had asked us to deal a little bit more with their products. They said, well, you know, all this art stuff the public doesn't understand. Why don't you do something with our products? So what we did is we just did a such a, we kind of created an iconography of peeling away. So instead of adding to the building, we created the image of the building by cutting back and then taking the merchandise and just going right through the thermal wall. Actually, a sculptor cast all of these objects on the outside. It's incredible. It was a masterpiece of casting. You can see here is a little fire engine going through, and then on the outside, it becomes the ghosted version of what's on the inside. What's interesting is that little kids understood this perfectly. Parents just absolutely couldn't figure out what was going on. But kids loved it, and uh, it really worked. And it also had a kind of an ominous quality to it. Different times of day, it took on different moods uh, that were sometimes humorous, obviously, and other times sort of apocalyptic. Anyway, the changing, another big changing point in my life came, we did this building, a kind of a jigsaw puzzle building in Florida. And uh, I'd always kind of liked it because you could sort of dress the building at any scale reference you wanted to. But what happened was a huge hurricane hit this building. And, uh, you know, it was very alarming. They called me on the phone in the middle of the night and said, the hurricane has destroyed the building, and, you know, we're going to sue you, and I don't know. a lot of things going on. But when I got down there and I saw the building, I said, my God, it's better than ever. You know? <laughs> so I, I really began to get interested in this idea of nature's revenge, that actually nature could impose upon architecture and create things far more interesting than the things we created ourselves. So I really got interested also in this idea of information flow. I mean, you look at a television set, for example, in your living room, you never look at the design of the set. It's always about this, this flow of digital information going through. And I got out interested in this whole idea that a building could be a, a filtering zone, like it could be just like a TV, or like a dialectic, you know, where the building is the point of synthesis so you weren't working so much with the form of the building, but the idea of what it absorbs. So I really got into that idea. And one of the first examples was at the tail end of the best building period, where we had a forest to deal with. And they said, well, you can't tear down the trees. The neighbors said, you have to preserve the landscape. And I'd always been intrigued, especially in Sicily, by, by buildings that were completely encrusted. You know, again, nature's revenge nature took over the building. So the building, in a sense, became a matrix for this process. So I thought it would be interesting to set up a building with that idea in the first place. So we built it around the trees so that the building could, would be absorbed ultimately by nature. Um, the company that did this has now since closed. Uh, the owner died about a year and a half ago. And this building, interestingly enough, talk about recycling, has been bought by a church. So now it's a religious building. It's gone from being a shopping center to a religious building, which is interesting because, you know, it did. It had this kind of a strange spiritual quality. It also dealt with something that's interested me a lot now, which is geology. Uh, it dealt with the above and below ground references. It, was, it dealt with inside and outside, but it also dealt with the geological terrain of that area because it's on a hillside, so we cut right through and reveal that through the glass of the walls. So it had a lot to do with uh, kind of rethinking the positioning of architecture in the natural environment. Uh, we did another building like that in Florida, this idea of the building as the garden and the garden as the building, which again was to save the vegetation because the neighborhood wanted that. We put it back into the building with a rainforest coming down the glass with, with water recycling down the glass. It cooled the building about 20%. It was the first time we really got into this idea of cooling through other, other means. But then it created this kind of vibrant building. When you're driving by it, the building seemed mutable and evolutionary. Rather than static, it was always kind of growing and shimmering and moving and so forth. So this is where we really, I really began to get into this idea that maybe the environment, maybe nature, trees, ecology, whatever, would have an impact. And I got interested in the whole history. And this is when I started writing my book that's coming out, I think, shortly hopefully next week, uh, from Tashin, which is really takes, goes back to Neolithic times, the idea of living with Earth, that all civilizations started this way. And then they began to ritualize. I mean, here you, you can see the beginning of the fountainhead right here, you know, all the little phallic symbols around the, the boss's house here. 
But it's interesting how, how you can see these transitions taking place. Japan, I, when I visited Japan, as did Frank Lloyd Wright, it was this incredible fusion, the idea of the garden as a kind of universal paradise. So that, you know, in, in uh, Zen philosophy, uh, paradise is a garden. So what you do on Earth is make a microcosm of the afterlife. And so the Japanese garden was appealing. And when I think of what's going on in America, I mean, all the visits around, I've been to about 30 countries, and the things I've seen, like this all over the world, and then I think of, you know, urban life, you know, I made a joke about it at the beginning, but it is pretty devastating, uh, particularly in a place like New York and, and New Jersey, where the absolute devastation of quality of life by, by doing this kind of process, or, you know, the way we plant trees in plazas. I'm, we moved our office near the Trade Center, so I'm very familiar with that area. Again, this is like trees as turds in the plaza, in a sense. Uh, when you, you know, I think of Italy again, when I used to th th go back to places I love in Italy, I mean, just look at the fusion of architecture and nature in a case like this. Uh, another thing that I got interested in was uh, environmental technology. But one thing I noted, and I think the reason I wrote this book, is every time somebody showed me one of these buildings, which was solar or whatever, it was always terribly ugly. It was always, yeah, yes, it's solar, but it's never art, you know. Yes, this is, you know, good, good conservation, or it may be, you know, sustainable for some reason. But then I would always look at incredible solar cities like this in Tunisia, for example, and say, well, this is a solar city too, totally solar, and it's lasted for five centuries, and it's beautiful. So obviously, art is important. I think art is the bottom line, uh, but I think that it also now we have to start thinking very seriously about environmental issues. I mean, people have a horror of the city now. Many people really have fled the cities. And um, one early project we did uh, dealing with that issue was human identity. I got very frustrated with it. You know, all buildings look like this. People don't have their identity. They don't have gardens. I've been fascinated with Singapore, where people kick the front of their buildings out. There's a kind of clandestine destruction of buildings. They kick the doors out. And the, wind is out, and then they plant their own gardens, and they're called illegal architecture. It's interesting enough that during the night they do this, and then they identify themselves with the building. So we did a project like that, which was all about identity and density, or you, a building of identities. So you could even take, a, for example, an old buildings about to be torn down, re-equip it, and then start planting buildings by just inserting the language any language you want to. So the architect's out of the picture. He's really the matrix designer. The orchestration is done by kind of automatic process. This is sort of automatic architecture. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of John Cage, but he did a lot of, of pieces that are sort of like found music or automatic music, found sound and so forth. So this is the equivalent. You can let the, let the inhabitants pick their doors and windows or whatever. Uh, they pick their gardens. And, uh, you know, we, we would design a matrix. In this case, we designed one with a courtyard. And, uh, you know, you would have a high, what we call the high rise of homes. Well, this was a kind of a gestural work, but it did get into this whole idea of what I would call identity and density, the idea of the city and what you do with it. It's still an object. I was still too much object thinking. And I began to get into the idea of the age of information and ecology, which is now really upon us. It's absolutely consuming all of you. Every young person in this room is now part, not of the industrial age, not part of the age that, that generated Corbusier and um, Rietveld and uh, De Stiel and all of those architects. We're not part of that. That's not anywhere remotely part of our reality anymore. We are now in a different time. And it calls for different thinking. I mean, it, literally, you're, it's all invisible, for example. I'm very interested in seeing if we can create invisible architecture to go with invisible ideas. Or on the other hand, it's the age of ecology. What are we going to do about the vast destruction of the Earth? I mean, the architecture uh, consumes almost two-thirds of the world's resources, meaning the building of shelter. So in a sense, it's the most imposing force created by human beings on the destruction of the Earth. So you really have that responsibility. It's a, it's, a, it's a growing responsibility. And then there's communication. And there's what we were talking about, internet all the time. And uh, as I say, buildings used to communicate. Why can't we make them communicate again? Why can't buildings be part of this information revolution? 
and uh, or part, as they were in Italy, of, of the ecological, where in fact nature and, uh, and architecture are simultaneous events. I began to get interested in also just hydrology and, and the sciences. Um, you know, why do we have to build things where there's incredible waste of water, like this endless asphalt? Uh, I really don't love asphalt that much, I'll tell you quite frankly. We need the hydrological cycle. We really absolutely need it. When you build everything paving, you see from this chart, you waste 70% of the water that falls on a city like New York is wasted. Rainwater, the most precious resource, wasted. If you, if you use different kinds of paving or planting, you can go, uh, lose only 10% of the water. So, you know, there's all these paving materials, which I've gotten interested in. Some of them are quite beautiful, actually, which let the water go through, don't prevent the hydrological cycle from taking place. Well, anyway, I got interested in all of these things. I got interested in Islamic architecture. I got interested in kind of the gardens of Babylon, the building as architecture, the fusion of buildings and the context and so forth. Uh, one example is in Seville, we did a, a large project for the Expo, which I think has subsequently become a museum of Colombian culture or something. But anyway, it's about a half a mile or half a kilometer, I'm sorry, water and vegetation work. It's that, what is climate control as art? I guess that's what you call it. And what it is, it's a huge structure wrapped in glass. We're, ta we're talking here, this is the biggest glass producing area of Italy, I mean of Italy, of Spain in Seville, so we obviously took what was available, which was in this case glass and water, which they have plenty of because they're on the Guadalquivir River. We made this whole thing in the configuration of the river, actually. One side is water, the other side is all vegetation. They all fuse together. Um, so the inside and the outside are all inside and outside simultaneously. When it was restaurants, they cooled the restaurants very effectively because of the water. It was nice because you're always seeing people kind of fused and they lose. They're kind of, again, your water does wonderful things with sort of illusion reality. Just to show you a little technical uh, construction, um, this is some of our own inventions, really, to make earth sheltered roofs. This was the earth sheltered roof, which was also the monorail station at the expo. You can see it under construction here. And what it is, is really a, an inverted waffle grid. So you can park big trees up there and still have, as you see here, you have a <coughs> thin edge. So you, it doesn't look heavy. It really actually, be, it bell bellies in the middle. So you have the volume where you can't see it. So it always looks like you're on a thin slab. It's effective. But on the other side, we grew all of the vegetation for the arcade about a year in advance. Then we just delivered it all in one day. So you can cover the entire arcade in one shot. So it would be a growing arcade from day one. For the columns underneath, these are um, tubes, tubes really that are perforated metal. There's seeded earth inside. And what happens, this is where they start. And then after about a month or two, they grow out and they make these vegetated columns. And then they make this kind of an atmosphere. And this is, you know, you, when you walked in the hot sun of Seville under this, it cooled the temperature about 20 degrees, probably. I mean, it really was built for that climate. Um, and again, these things flower at all times of year. So there's, there's a, it's kind of architecture as vegetation. It's a vegetation experience. And it also created these enclaves. I mean, campuses like this desperately need enclaves of conversation. We created a lot of them, and they really, really work, because people get together, they... They, and it's also it had a, a dramatic event style aspect on the river. I mean, you see it on the Guadalquivir River at night. But it also had another thing that I'm getting interested in, which is architecture you don't just look at, but you smell it, you touch it, you feel it. Again, it goes back to this prosthetic and psychological connections. So you have architecture that's involved with all of the senses. This is the last thing I'll show you, really. It's a Chattanooga River project. Um, it's a very beautiful river. And unfortunately, they built a huge aquarium there. Then after they got it built, they called us up and said, well, you know, it's awfully big. Can we cover it up with trees? Um, so our problem was to, to build a park, a very large park on the Tennessee River, which is called Ross's Landing. One of the themes was we decided to build with the history of the community. So there are all the paving is a series of bands that are part of that history, the history of Bessie Smith, the history of the American Indians in that area, the history of the railroad. So 
the history of the old canal. Actually, we opened up the old canal, as you can see there. And then, you know, what happened is that these things would lift up occasionally, make fountains, water features, bridges. The one in the background is a, uh, an amphitheater. <coughs> uh, it, it really created a kind of, again, a kind of a magnetic situation for people. I really believe very strongly that the performance of people and the fusion of that experience with architecture is really part of that new world. You know, you can really create situations that work. We also did a lot of um, earth shelter there, earth sheltered uh, archways. These are earth sheltered buildings. Um, this is on opening day, just to show you kind of, I love this kind of mutable quality of, a, of, of this kind of building, where the opening of the building is kind of barren, and then after about a year, it begins to grow in. So the whole building which you actually can sit on and everything. You, you really can see it as that. This is covered, this waterfall here covers up the very ugly offices of that aquarium. And uh, again, it's again about water and vegetation and framing the city. And, uh, as a connected project, or this is probably going to be my posthumous project because it keeps being on again, off again, but it's one I'm interested in. They asked us to do another project for the hillside next to the park called. Uh, I can't remember the name of the hill. It's a little hill uh, next to it. But it was going to be, our idea was to make an aquatorium, which would celebrate the history of water and civilization. Not water and fish, not water and technology, but really about water and people. Water and religion, water and music, water and art, water and, water and culture of all kinds. So it's going to be called an aquatorium. It means a sight, sound, and touch. It would tell the story of water and people. Again, this is, this is the message of it. It's on, it's Kirkman Hill, it's called. It's a round hill, so it kind of lent itself to this kind of global image, the idea of the, you know, water the planet. So we're carving, the idea is to carve this thing into the hill so it's completely fused. Like, unlike the uh, aquarium in the foreground, which stands up as an object, this literally becomes part of that hill. Most of the exhibits, in fact, are underground because they deal with, you know, subjects dealing with moisture and hydrology. So it's, it's appropriate to put a lot of it underground. So you literally enter the hillside. And uh, it's built on a, so it overlooks the river, obviously. It's part of our park. It carries the theme of the park into the building. One side, of, there's a waterway through the middle, rainforest in the middle. One side is all exhibitions. The other side is part of the university, and it's all libraries and study centers. <coughs> Uh, the interesting thing, again, this one was this, again, inside-outside, using this um, idea. I know somebody said this looks like a fertility chart. But it's, <coughs> excuse me, it's um, really about making an inside-outside relationship using uh, what I call passages, a system of passages through the building. And each of the walls, as it's passing from inside and outside and above ground, below ground, uh, it becomes whatever it's about. You know, there's water, water and hydrology, water and technology, water and bridge building, water and ecology, and so forth. So this kind of passing through and back and forth is really part of the way the, the building is. In front, we, since it's a water study center, we thought it'd be fun if the people could actually go in the subject, eat water, culture, food, and then go and bathe and be in a sauna or something. So. You would experience the subject of the museum physically at the end of the day. And then at the end of the day, it was all, uh, you, you could sit out on the terrace overlooking the river, and this would connect to our park next door. Well, anyway, just to conclude, um, I think that your generation, and I'm speaking primarily to those of you in your 20s, will probably be rethinking this paradigm of the city. I mean, it, it's, first of all, not ecologically correct, because these buildings are incredibly wasteful all that exposure. We're going to be talking about clustered housing. We're going to be talking about people living at home. More than 10,000 families live at home per year because of the computer. You don't have to go to the office every day. Um, so that's going to create a whole new kind of community life. If everybody's living at home working, why on earth would they have to build buildings like this? Um, you know, again, this idea of the egocentric building versus the ecocentric building. Um, I mean, there's just a lot of mistakes, a lot of things that need serious rethinking at this point in time. And I think it's, it's probably 
really what education should be about. I haven't got any answers. I'm not up here giving answers. What I did is really kind of tried today to sort of tell you my story. In other words, how I went through certain thinking processes. And, um, you know, for better or for worse, I came to certain conclusions. But I do think that without that kind of thinking process and without that kind of self-criticism all the time, it's very difficult to go on to, to something new. Uh, I, I think our generation, the new generation, will think of ecology as the model of integrated systems, very much like communications technology is integrated systems as well. And uh, then the final message of this whole point today is this is the age of environmental thinking. Uh, just to end on a sort of a humorous note, I, I, I like to end it on this because this is a very funny situation. But uh, five or six years ago, a Paris magazine asked uh, five or six famous architects, what would you do with your own city? So I got this letter in the mail, and I looked at New York, and I said, well, you know, obviously the greening of New York is the only choice. So just as a joke, you know, I made this watercolor, and I sent it back to the magazine. This is my little watercolor of New York. And, um, you know, it, it was published in the magazine. Well, it was very interesting, because again, the issue, you know, letters to the editor came back. And there were all, and, and first of all, no one seemed to get the fact that it was a joke. I mean, everybody took this dead serious. So on one column, there were all these letters from outraged architects, which just like the good old days, you know, outraged architects, how stupid that idea this was, couldn't possibly be done. You know, sight doing something incredibly, you know, disturbing once one more time, we're off the wall. And the other column was all these letters from ecologists and, and botanists and science telling us how we could do it. So it is this kind of age, you know, it's this age of rethinking. It really is. And um, so what I want to leave you with today, I, I've invented this new word. It's a, it's a mouthful, Ecotech Archon. But it's really a co combined uh, ecological initiatives, environmental technology, architecture, and art. And I've been told it's a, it's, that if you see someone of the opposite sex that you're attracted to, that it's a great pickup line. You just walk up to them in a bar and say, Ecotech Archon, and they fall into your arms. And on that note, I'd like to say thank you very much, and that's the end of it. <laughs> thank you. I don't know if there are any questions. My voice is fading fast here, but I would feel a few if there are any. Okay. Shy. It's like my university. I'm trying to get them all to speak out. But this the uh, no. You know what happened is a Hong Kong developer came in, hated it for whatever reason. He hated, it, tore it all down, and then was told by the city that he had to re either rebuild it or build another public space. So he had one, and for, so it cost a million, and then he went bankrupt. Can you imagine? I mean, that's a short, long story made short, but it was you know, like a year of protest by the community to save it, and this, this Hong Kong developer just tore it down, and that was the end of it. And then, then was commanded that he had to build a public space again. So it's like one of those odd realities. Any other questions? Okay. I guess we have a kind of a social, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Right. A little bit, um, but not much. I mean, he was really a pretty sophisticated guy. Um, I must say, the first time, I remember he, he was convinced, but then he said, well, you know, my board of directors is going to have a few words to say about this. So we went and made this presentation to the board of directors. And, you know, I turned all the lights after the presentation because the blood had drained out of every face in the room. They were sitting there just aghast. And, they, and then they gave, you know, 200 reasons why this shouldn't be done. And then he, he told me, he said, well, James, I, you know, after the meeting, I want you to come to my office. And I, but he had to write down all these little notes, you know, what they hated about it, you know. And then and when I went back to his office, he just tore up the notes and said, okay, go ahead. So <laughs> uh, I would advise, well, I have two words of advice for young people. One of them is marry rich. Let's start with that one. Um, you know, uh, especially if you're going to be an architect or an idealistic architect. And the second is try to find a patron. 
early on in life. It's very, very difficult to, to get to just work with clients, normal clients. Uh, in a way, we got spoiled because the first four or five of the people that were, you know, paid for our works were in fact art patrons. So, and now we've regained them. I mean, in the last year, I, I, I didn't, couldn't show. I'm mean, a bit too long today. I was going to show you some recent work, but we're doing um, work again for art patrons in Italy, particularly, and um, it's really great because, you know, you're really talking to people who understand. The, the premises. Um, you know, we have a, a thing we're doing for the Venice Biennale now, uh, which is an art patron supporting, but I mean, you know, a normal architecture client of a million years. Uh, we're calling it Ville Radiers, which is a kind of common, this is the whole area of the Biennale where they used to have all these oil tanks. And, you know, oil is, you know, the sun, product of the sun, and the Ville Radiers never anticipated that oil was going to cause as much trouble as it did. So, there's this huge crane there, and what we're doing is hoisting this. We found thousands of mannequins. We're painting them all black, soaking them in oil, putting them in a big cargo net, and hoisting them in a silhouette against the sky with these thousands of arms and legs, and then dripping oil into this huge reflection pool of oil. That's going to be our contribution. And uh, you, you, that's not the kind of thing you easily sell to the average client, I'll tell you. So I would advise, if you're going to do that kind of work, um, where you're involved with social commentary, where you're involved with critique and all that kind of thing, that probably very early on, maybe your own parents should be your clients. In fact, a lot of architects do start that way. I mean, I would say start with somebody in the family or a rich relative or somebody that would, or preferably somebody who really kind of understands what you're trying to say. Uh, it's not easy to find, but it's, a, it's certainly a good way to get your courage up. Because the, uh, a lot of young people just go off and work in you know standard offices and very often the idealism that you generate while you're young like this in school, you'll lose after about 20 minutes in Skidmore and some marrow, you know, and 10 minutes later it's all gone. Your idealism's down the drain. Okay, I think my voice is going here, so maybe we should, I'll, I'll talk quietly at a social. Okay, thanks again, really.